This is Randy Henniger with Arcana Laboratories coming to you from Little Rock, Arkansas with the first installment of Arcana Presents. The title of today's talk is an update on the etiology and pathogenesis of collapsing glomerulopathy. A plethora of new and interesting data has emerged over the past several years regarding the pathogenesis of FSGS and its variants. Today, we'll take a look at, at how this new information has reshaped our understanding as to how and why collapsing lesions form. During the early part of the AIDS epidemic, a subset of HIV-infected patients developed an aggressive form of nephropathy with a distinct morphology that included an atypical form of FSGS with glomerular epithelial cell proliferation. Shortly thereafter, a similar morphology was reported in patients without HIV infection. But it wasn't until 1994 that these lesions were placed collectively under the rubric of collapsing glomerulopathy, a term first coined by Detweiler and colleagues at the University of North Carolina. From this point on, I'll be abbreviating the term collapsing glomerulopathy to CG to help alleviate the monotony. CG is currently classified as a variant of FSGS according to the Columbia Schema, where it preempts all other variants by virtue of its clinical aggressiveness. The overwhelming majority of patients present outright with nephrotic range proteinuria or nephrotic syndrome coupled with renal insufficiency or failure. It occurs far more frequently in adults than children and shows a strong predilection for individuals of West African descent. Patients progress more rapidly towards end stage relative to other FSGS variants, and the median renal survival of patients with non-HIV collapsing glomerulopathy ranges between 13 to 16 months post-biopsy. The diagnosis of CG hinges on two key elements as seen by light microscopy. First, glomeruli exhibit segmental to global retraction of the tuft with collapse and corrugation of the capillary loops. Tuft collapse may be subtle or severe as shown in the panels. Secondly, glomerular epithelial cells overlying areas of tuft collapse display hypertrophy with reactive nuclear atypia, prominent protein resorption droplets, and cytoplasmic vacuolization, as shown by the red arrow. Hypertrophy is often accompanied by hyperplastic changes as well. In fact, epithelial cell hypertrophy can be exuberant and fill Bowman space, resulting in the formation of pseudocrescents, shown by the yellow arrow. Pseudocrescents are designated as such based on the belief that they are derived from podocytes in contrast to true crescents which form from parietal epithelial cells lining Bowman's capsule. Tubular interstitial involvement in CG is variable, but most cases show tubular interstitial disease, usually manifesting as interstitial scarring, tubular atrophy, and chronic interstitial inflammation. Microcystic tubular dilatation is another hallmark of CG, but is not necessary for the diagnosis. It's characterized by focally ectatic tubules lined by markedly attenuated epithelial cells with accumulation of abundant PAS-positive cast material. These changes can occur early on in the disease. CG is not an immune complex-mediated disease. Accordingly, immunofluorescence microscopy shows either negative or nonspecific staining. Nonspecific staining may manifest as nonspecific entrapment of IgM and C3 within glomerular scars or as nonspecific trafficking of immune reactants through the mesangium. CG is classified as a podocytopathy and therefore expected to exhibit extensive foot process effacement by electron microscopy. It should be emphasized, however, that Helmut Renke's group at the Brigham reported that only 57% of HIV-associated collapsing glomerulopathy, and only 38% of non-HIV cases showed extensive foot process effacement. Our observations here at our Canna Labs recapitulate Renke's findings, so we don't require significant effacement to diagnose collapsing glomerulopathy. Before Detweiler popularized the term collapsing glomerulopathy, this malignant variant of FSGS had become widely recognized as a component of AIDS and HIV-related nephropathy. The lesion was therefore tightly associated with HIV infection and categorized as an acquired condition, even though similar lesions were described in patients without infection as early as 1985. Since then, CG has been associated with a wide range of conditions other than HIV and indicative of a final common pathway arising from multiple etiology shown here. Consequently, collapsing glomerulopathy represents a histologic pattern of injury rather than a distinct disease entity. 
Regarding genetic associations, the ApoL1 gene appears to play a major role in the pathogenesis of CG. It has been known for some time that CG has a strong predilection for descendants from Western Sub-Saharan Africa, including African Americans. The link resides within specific mutations of the ApoL1 gene that evolved some 10,000 years ago as a defense mechanism against certain subspecies of trypanosome. Trypanosomes are protozoan parasites that affect both humans and animals in poor rural areas of sub-Saharan Africa. The parasites are transmitted by the tsetse fly, and infection of the host results in sleeping sickness. ApoL1 plays a key role in protecting humans from the parasite. It just so happens that the bloodborne trypanosomes feed off the serum apolipoprotein, and unfortunately for them, the ApoL family plays a role in innate immunity. Specifically, ApoL1 acts as a trypanolytic factor. Once consumed, wild-type ApoL1 forms a multimer that inserts into the lysosomal membranes of the parasite and creates a weakly active pore, as shown on the far left. The multiple is then trafficked to the cell membrane, where the shift from an acidic to neutral pH environment fully activates the pore. The result is cation efflux and influx with cell swelling and death of the parasite. However, certain subspecies of trypanosome developed defense mechanisms that inhibited membrane insertion and thereby circumvented the lytic effects of ApoL1, as shown within the red box. In reaction, certain sub-Saharan human populations gained evolutionary advantage by mutating the ApoL1 gene to counter the threat and regain its trypanolytic function. These allelic mutations are referred to today as G1 and G2. Unfortunately, the cost of this evolutionary one-upmanship came at a great price. Paired expression of the G1 or G2 risk alleles of ApoL1 confer markedly increased susceptibility to renal disease among global descendants of sub-Saharan Africans and is linked to a whole host of non-diabetic kidney diseases in African Americans, including HIV-associated nephropathy, FSGS, hypertension-attributed nephrosclerosis, sickle cell nephropathy, lupus nephritis, and chronic end-stage kidney disease. Many of these disorders exhibit a collapsing phenotype. The mechanisms involved in ApoL1-induced injury to human cells are not well understood, though signaling pathways resulting in apoptosis, necroptosis, and autophagy have been implicated. A recent report by Obelisi and colleagues from Martin Pollock's lab in Boston describes a mechanism of, of injury in human cells that bears similarities to the trypanolytic process described earlier. This study used human embryonic kidney cells expressing G1 or G2 encoded ApoL1 in comparison with the wild-type protein. The results show that ApoL1 proteins traffic to the plasma cell membrane to form active pores, depicted here in yellow. The ApoL1 pores facilitate efflux of intracellular potassium and influx of extracellular sodium and result in cell swelling, similar to what happens in trypanosomes. They also showed that depletion of intracellular potassium causes activation of P38, JNK, and erc mapk transduction pathways. The P38 and JNK signaling pathways are comprised of stress-activated phosphokinases that, when activated, result in cell toxicity and death. GP130 STAT3 signaling is downregulated, but its role here has not yet been determined. These findings are important because they suggest that certain kinase inhibitors may be useful for the treatment of ApoL1 injury induced in humans. The pathogenesis of collapsing glomerulopathy has also been linked to mitochondrial dysfunction. CoQ2 nephropathy is an autosomal recessive disorder characterized by a deficiency of CoQ10, otherwise known as ubiquinone. The deficiency results in proliferation and accumulation of dysmorphic mitochondria, as shown in the figure below, which depicts a podocyte containing numerous and large mitochondria with disorganized Christi. The oxidative stress engendered by the CoQ10 deficiency causes disruption of podocyte function, which in turn alters the integrity of the glomerular filtration barrier and results in nephrotic syndrome. A role for apoptosis has also been implicated as a possible cause of podocyte injury in CoQ10 deficiencies. CoQ10 has multiple functions, including shuttling of electrons along the mitochondrial respiratory chain, pyrimidine biosynthesis, beta oxidation of lipids, antioxidation, and modulation of apoptosis. 
It's synthesized by at least 13 genes, including CoQ2, which encodes a polyprenyl transferase whose name is too long for me to pronounce. Mutations of CoQ2 result in ubiquinone deficiency, which in turn leads to a spectrum of phenotypes ranging from isolated nephrotic syndrome to a fatal neonatal multisystem disorder. The link between CG and mitochondrial dysfunction is bolstered by the KD slash KD mouse model of collapsing glomerulopathy, where the KD alleles harbor a missense mutation in a parental transferase-like mitochondrial protein. Interestingly, ApoL1 risk alleles also cause mitochondrial dysfunction in certain cultured cells. Action myoclonus renal failure, mandibuloacral dysplasia, and galloway moat syndrome are rare autosomal recessive disorders caused by known genetic mutations. The mechanisms leading to CG are unclear, however. Other possible etiologies of collapsing glomerulopathy include viral, bacterial, and parasitic infections, of which HIV has the strongest association. Several reports also indicate a viable connection to parvovirus B19. There is also growing evidence that CMV infection is related to the collapsing phenotype post-transplant. Any linkage between the remaining infections and collapsing glomerulopathy are tenuous at best and is limited to case reports or small case series. Collapsing lesions have also been described in the setting of autoimmune disease, especially SLE. There's a weak association of CG with certain hematopoietic diseases. Several drugs have been linked to CG, especially bisphosphonates and interferon. Interestingly, the proteinuria will often remit after stopping interferon therapy, but less often with bisphosphonates. Calcineurin inhibitors have been implicated in post-transplant collapsing glomerulopathy. This finding is more likely a combination of CNI-induced vasculopathy and subsequent ischemia rather than direct toxicity to the podocytes. The connection between ischemia and CG is also supported by studies documenting collapsing lesions in the setting of cholesterol atheroembolism, thrombotic microangiopathy, diabetic vasculopathy, and renal infarction. An important point needs to be made about the potential role of ApoL1 risk alleles in cases of collapsing glomerulopathy and its aforementioned associations. There is growing evidence that secondary modifiers, or so-called second hits, and specific epistatic interactions may be required for the clinical manifestation of ApoL1-related disease. Data suggests that the second hit scenario is highly likely in cases of CG that arise in the setting of HIV infection, parvovirus B19, SLE, and primary membranous glomerulopathy arising in African Americans. While little is known about ApoL1 expression and other etiologies linked to CG, it's tempting to apply the second hit concept to many of the associations talked about today. So, collapsing glomerulopathy has been attributed to several etiologies, but its pathogenesis is still not completely understood. The longstanding presumption is that the characteristic epithelial changes of CG are the direct result of podocyte injury, for instance, HIV infection of the podocyte, which then leads to hypertrophy and hyperplasia, or enlargement or heaping up of the podocytes along the contracted capillary loops. There are plenty of data to bolster that supposition. For instance, earlier studies by Laura Barrasoni and others utilized an immunohistochemical approach to document phenotypic changes within glomeruli in an attempt to provide insight into the pathogenesis of collapsing glomerulopathy. They compared the phenotypic expression of mature glomerular epithelial cell markers and cell cycle-related proteins in HIV-related and non-HIV collapsing glomerulopathy with that of normal human fetal and adult kidney tissue. While nestin and dystroglycan were conserved in the collapsing lesions consistent with the presence of podocytes, many of the other mature markers were lost. The loss of mature markers was accompanied by neo-expression of PAX2. PAX2 is a nuclear transcription factor that helps to regulate the proliferation and differentiation of various cell types in a wide range of tissues, including kidney. PAX2 activity is suppressed by the action of tumor suppressor gene WT1. Therefore, loss of WT1 activity activates PAC2, which was interpreted by Barrisoni and others as a dysregulation event within injured but mature podocytes. Meanwhile, the neo-expression of cytokeratins and cell proliferation marker Key 67 coupled with the loss of mature markers and cell cycle inhibitors P27 and P57 indicated a dedifferentiated state of podocytes and initiation of a proliferative state. So, the results were consistent with an aberrant expression pattern 
which implied podocyte dysregulation, dedifferentiation, entry into the cell cycle, and cellular proliferation. The findings were somewhat surprising, however, since podocytes are classified as terminally differentiated cells and considered incapable of proliferation. Regardless, Barisoni's theory of podocyte dysregulation, dedifferentiation, and proliferation has served as the prevailing model of CG pathogenesis for well over a decade. This paradigm is being challenged, however, by the application of more sophisticated technologies to the study of podocytopathies, including collapsing glomerulopathy. CG was initially recognized as a malignant form of FSGS and has been labeled as such ever since. So it's no surprise that when we tend to frame its pathogenesis through the lens of FSGS. Experimental models of classic FSGS induce podocyte injury and loss, which ultimately leads to segmental glomerulosclerosis in a sequential fashion, as shown here. Panel A depicts a normal glomerular capillary loop within the GBM, shown in green. Fenestrated endothelial cells in tan, and podocytes and foot processes in light blue. Mesangial cells, abbreviated MC, produce mesangial matrix, which serves as the scaffolding around which the capillary loops wind. The basement membrane surrounding Bowman's capsule, abbreviated BCBM, is lined by parietal epithelial cells, or PECs, shown in red. Panel B shows podocyte injury manifesting as foot process effacement and focal podocyte denudation, which exposes the underlying GBM. An adhesion, or TA, forms between the parietal epithelial cells and the denuded GBM. This contact activates PECs in the vicinity of the adhesion. An activated PEC is shown in dark purple. Panel C depicts how activated PECs deposit matrix material to form a broad, fibrous, tuft attachment. Some PECs migrate onto the glomerular tuft via the attachment and deposit matrix along the outside of the GBM. We'll examine this process more closely in a moment. Mesangial cells are also activated and secrete collagen matrix, which encroaches on and occludes the capillary lumen. As blood flow is reduced through the capillary loops, plasma proteins precipitate within the lumen as hyaline deposits. Hyaline deposition is sometimes accompanied by histiocytic foam cells that then obliterates the capillary lumen. Panel D shows a fully formed segmental sclerosis with collapse of the capillary lumen around trapped hyaline. The paper by Warham and colleagues from the University of Michigan took this concept of podocytopenia a step further by showing that the extent of glomerulosclerosis correlated with the amount of podocyte loss or reduction. They developed a rat model tagged with a podocyte-specific transgene expressing the diphtheria toxin receptor. Administration of the toxin resulted in a podocyte loss in a dose-dependent manner. In other words, higher doses of toxin resulted in greater depletion of podocytes and higher rates of proteinuria. The results also indicated that glomeruli could recover transient loss of function if podocyte loss was less than 20%. Losses exceeding 20 to 40%, on the other hand, correlated with a significantly increased incidence of FSGS and proteinuria and decreased renal function. This study helped to solidify the notion that podocytopenia, that is the loss or reduction of podocytes, was a seminal event in the pathogenesis of FSGS. It also quantitated podocytopenia and related it to outcomes. To recap, injury to the podocytes can result in one, minor damage with subsequent repair, two, cell death and detachment of the podocytes, or three, injury that does not necessarily result in podocyte loss, but alters the integrity of the glomerular filtration barrier just enough to result in ongoing proteinuria, which in turn continues to injure the podocytes. Podocyte loss exceeding 20% increases the risk of progression to FSGS, whereas podocyte loss of less than 20% increases the chances of recovery. Notice that the repair process requires reconstitution of podocyte numbers. This concept of reconstitution will be the subject of the remainder of the talk. Acknowledgement of the link between podocyte depletion and FSGS subsequently sparked interest in the mechanisms responsible for podocyte replenishment. Self-renewal seemed unlikely since podocytes are terminally differentiated cells. Indeed, several animal models characterized by podocyte depletion and repletion show no evidence of podocyte proliferation. 
Instead, attention has focused on parietal epithelial cells, or PECs, because data in humans and rodents implicate PECs as precursors to podocytes during development. During glomerular development, PECs proliferate to populate the lining of Bowman's capsule. The figure details the events that are required for a parietal epithelial cell to differentiate into a podocyte. The key elements are listed and include a symphony of nuclear transcription factors, signal transduction pathways in the receptors, and regulators of the cell cycle. These components are turned on and off in an orchestrated fashion that is too tedious to detail here. The reference at the bottom of the screen can provide you with further details. The signaling profile of PEC progenitors is shown at the bottom of the figure. Notice that the expression profile of the PEC progenitor is similar to what Barrisoni and colleagues ascribed to dedifferentiated podocytes. The seminal initiating events are the downregulation of WT1 activity, which activates PAC2, followed by constitutive activation of the beta catenin WNT signaling pathway in cyclin D1. Sometime during the late S phase of glomerular development, however, the signaling pathways are altered in such a way that stimulates a subset of PECs to differentiate into podocytes and populate the glomerular tuft. Subsequent suppression of the beta catenin WNT signaling pathway is an essential step in the differentiation of PECs to podocytes. The signaling profile of the fully differentiated podocyte is listed at the top and is one of terminal differentiation. In vitro data bolster the concept that PECs can serve as progenitors to podocytes. Exposure of human PEC cultures to differentiated media, such as VRADD, which is a combination of vitamin D3, retinoic acid, and dexamethasone, or to reagents such as retinoic acid, or to knockdown of microRNA-193A, can induce differentiation into podocytes. Notice in the figure how the more primitive cytoskeleton of PECs to the left progresses to the more complex cytoskeleton of podocytes to the right following stimulation. While PECs clearly serve as podocyte progenitors in utero and in vitro, is there evidence that they can serve as the primary reservoir for podocytes after gestation? A preponderance of the evidence suggests that indeed they can. Human glomeruli contain a population of stem and progenitor cells that occur along Bowman's capsule and are identified by the co-expression of CD24 and CD133, two surface molecules that are shared by different types of human adult stem cells. These CD24 and CD133 positive progenitor cells are localized to the urinary pole of Bowman's capsule and are shown in red. Like all stem cells, they have the capacity to proliferate and self-renew, unlike mature podocytes shown here in light green. As the kidney grows during childhood and adolescence, CD24 positive and CD133 positive pecs migrate along the capsule towards the vascular pole in order to reach the glomerular tuft. As they approach the hilum, their expression profile changes to include podocyte-specific markers depicted here as half green and half red cells. Further migration along the vascular stalk promotes the transition to mature podocytes with complete loss of CD24 and 133. Do parietal epithelial cells serve as podocyte progenitors into adulthood? Animal models suggest that while PECs continue to serve as a reservoir for podocytes in juvenile and adult mice, their capacity to do so does not extend into adulthood, at least not through the mechanism just discussed. In our earlier discussion about the pathogenesis of FSGS, we talked about how bridges form between Bowman's capsule and denuded areas of the glomerular tuft, which allows for the migration of PECs into the tuft, and that these PECs then stimulate glomerulosclerosis. So, bridging is usually characterized as a pathologic process that results in the formation of FSGS lesions. However, some have argued that bridging may also be used for minor repairs to the tuft. In other words, quick replenishment of a few lost podocytes, as shown in the figure. The question is whether or not the stem cells are capable of maturing into podocytes without making the southerly migration around the vascular pole, since bridging preempts that journey. The answer to that question is unclear. There is evidence, however, to suggest that depletion of large numbers of podocytes, say greater than 40% or more, compromises the regenerative capacity of the parietal stem cells to the point that they become a liability to the glomerulus. 
When progenitor pecs bridge the gap between Bowman's capsule and the injured part of the tuft, they become activated in a way that promotes sclerosis, that is, they secrete extracellular matrix, as shown here in purple, likely in response to TGF-beta derived from the injured podocytes. The end result is segmental sclerosis of the tuft, in other words, FSGS as we described earlier. It should be emphasized here, too, that the regenerative response of progenitor pecs is further compromised by age, genetic defects, and environmental factors. Laura Lasagna and Paula Romagnini, two leading researchers in this area, speculate that parietal stem cells lose their plasticity with age, which may explain why glomerular disorders have a better prognosis during childhood, whereas FSGS is more frequent in older patients. This loss of regenerative potential could also play a role in age senescence of glomeruli, that is the progressive increase in global glomerulosclerosis with aging. Activation of PECs is accompanied by neo-expression of CD44 on their surface. CD44 is a cell surface glycoprotein that's involved in cell-to-cell -cell interaction, cell adhesion, cell migration, lymphocyte activation and homing, hematopoiesis, tumor metastasis, just to name a few of its functions. It occurs across a wide range of cell types and has numerous ligands. The figure shown here depicts an experimental mouse model of FSGS that we'll discuss in greater detail shortly. The top panel shows progression of FSGS lesions from left to right in tissue sections stained with PAS. The asterisks denote areas of glomerular sclerosis, and the arrowheads point to reactive PECs. The bottom panel shows that the PECs are decorated by antibodies against CD44, which stains brown. Notice in panels M and N that CD44 positive PECs are located closest to the tuft adhesions, and that PECs lining Bowman's capsule away from the adhesions do not express CD44. While the function of CD44 is not clear in FSGS, it does serve as an effective marker for PEC activation. Clearly, the cellular response to podocyte injury is different in collapsing glomerulopathy than in other variants of FSGS, as evidenced by the marked hypertrophy and hyperplasia of glomerular epithelial cells. Remember from our earlier discussion that the pseudocrescents of CG were initially attributed to the dysregulation, dedifferentiation, and proliferation of podocytes, and that this process is what distinguished collapsing glomerulopathy from other variants of FSGS. Data from several experimental animals, however, show that the hyperplastic component is largely comprised of pecs. After massive podocyte injury, the parietal stem cells, again shown in red, react by generating cell bridges with denuded areas at several different points along the tuft. However, extensive loss of the podocytes coupled with extensive bridging theoretically alters the structure of the glomerular tuft in the form of partial tuft collapse. Conceivably, retraction of the capillary loops makes a poor scaffolding for migrating pecs, which affects their polarity, initiates abnormal proliferation, and results in the characteristic hyperplastic lesions. So, the difference between collapsing glomerulopathy and other variants of FSGS may be based on, one, a greater degree of podocyte depletion, two, greater loss of tuft integrity, and three, a higher level of pec activation. The next slide shows expression of stem cell marker CD24 and CD133 in a collapsing lesion from a patient with CG. The figure on the left depicts a PAS stain of an affected glomerulus, showing implosion of the tuft with surrounding hyperplastic epithelial cells typical of CG. The middle and right panels show persistence of stem cell marker CD24 and CD133 in the epithelial cells comprising the hyperplastic lesion. These results suggest that CD44 positive or activated pecs are prosclerotic and lack the capacity to mature into podocytes. Consequently, the neo-expression of CD44, coupled with the persistence of stem cell markers CD24 and CD133 on the surface of migrated pecs that form the hyperplastic lesions of collapsing glomerulopathy, implies two things. One, dysregulation of pecs, and two, failure of pecs to mature or differentiate into podocytes. This concept contrasts with Barrisoni's earlier contention that the hyperplastic lesions of CG sprang from podocytes that underwent dysregulation, dedifferentiation, and proliferation. Furthermore, Barrisoni's theory is also undermined by the concept of mitotic catastrophe. 
Podocytes are highly complex cells and are terminally differentiated. Even if forced into G1, G2 phase, podocytes lack the machinery to complete cytokinesis, which results in aneuploidy, loss of polarity, detachment from the underlying basement membrane, and cell death. Since podocytes are vulnerable to this process of mitotic catastrophe, they then lack the ability to proliferate. Now let's take a brief look at several sophisticated experimental models that have helped to fortify our understanding about the pathogenesis of collapsing glomerulopathy. These models utilize podocyte-specific or PEC-specific transgenes that are cloned into established mouse models of FSGS. These cell-specific transgenes can function as reporter genes. In other words, they can encode a protein in vivo that can be then visualized ex vivo and used to track the fate of specific cells, either during development, during various physiologic manipulations, or during disease progression. We'll examine how this powerful technology has been deployed to determine the cell lineages involved in the progression of FSGS and collapsing glomerulopathy. But before we do, let's briefly discuss the nature of the reporter gene constructs. The reporter transgene usually consists of four components. The first component is a gene sequence that facilitates insertion of the construct into specific cells, say podocytes, for instance. This gene sequence is also referred to as a targeting vector. Two, a promoter is required to switch the reporter gene on. Depending on its design, the promoter can function to activate the reporter gene spontaneously during development or can be induced postnatally with some exogenous reagent. For example, a doxycycline-inducible promoter is often used. Give the animal doxycycline and it activates the third component, the gene that encodes the reporter protein itself. The reporting gene is oftentimes, but not always, the LAC-Z gene derived from E. coli, which encodes the enzyme beta-galactosidase. The final component is the CRELOX-P recombination sequence. When the inducible promoter is activated and turns on the reporter gene, the CRELOX-P system allows for constitutive activation of the promoter, so the reporter gene will continue to report for the life of the cell. One quick disclaimer before we move on. The descriptions of the experimental models that we're about to discuss have been oversimplified due to their complex nature and to save time. Furthermore, specific data have been taken out of context and presented in a way that I hope captures the essence of each study. My apologies to the authors for short shrifting their results for the sake of simplicity. Suzuki and colleagues were one of the first to use cell fate mapping also known as lineage tracing, in a mouse model of collapsing glomerulopathy. CG was induced in mice that were deficient in the cell cycle inhibitor P21. It was suggested at the time that P21 played a role in glomerular injury, but how is not clear. Accordingly, P21 deficient mice were crossbred with podocyte-specific Cree-expressing reporter mice. Collapsing glomerulopathy was induced by intraperitoneal injection of duck anti-rabbit kidney antibodies. Collapsing lesions could be identified as early as five days, as shown on the right. Panel A depicts a normal glomerulus from a control reporter mouse. The podocytes are genetically tagged with a reporter gene that was constitutively activated during development. The reporter construct includes the LAC-Z gene, which encodes the enzyme beta-galactosidase. The enzyme is being produced here in large enough quantities to be visualized by a standard enzyme histochemical procedure. The stain decorates the cytoplasm of the podocytes as a brilliant blue, as shown in panel A. Panels B through F are representative glomeruli from P21 deficient mice with collapsing glomerulopathy, where podocyte injury and depletion was induced 5 and 14 days after injection of the anti rabbit kidney antibodies. The glomeruli show a spectrum of collapsing lesions ranging from mild to marked and are accompanied by variable loss of podocytes, as evidenced here by the marked reduction of bright blue staining relative to panel A. In essence, these results indicate that the hyperplastic epithelial cells that comprise collapsing lesions are not podocytes. If not podocytes, then what is the cell of origin? To answer that question requires some additional techniques. In fact, cell fate mapping is often complemented by cell markers detected by other techniques. Suzuki and colleagues used immunohistochemistry to help determine the cell types and their distribution in the experimental model just discussed. The figure on the left shows a segmental collapsing lesion from a 
P21 deficient mouse. The blue staining demarcates the distribution of podocytes in one part of the tuft, whereas absence of staining denotes a loss of podocyte in the segmental lesion. In the figure to the right, the arrow points to Claudin 1 expression localized to the area of segmental collapse. Claudin 1 is a cell marker for parietal epithelial cells or PECs. So the cumulative findings are consistent with the notion that PECs comprise the epithelial component of the collapsing lesion. In another example, the experiment depicted here by Smeets and colleagues utilizes the 5-6 nephrectomy model of secondary FSGS. The nephrectomy obviously causes massive loss of nephron mass by about 80%, which results in hyperfiltration and tuft enlargement. The addition of deoxycorticosterone acetate, or DOCO, which is an agent commonly used to induce hypertension in experimental animals, coupled with the salt, accelerates the progression of FSGS. Reporter mice are bred multiple times with mice susceptible to FSGS. Panel shows the basic reporter gene construct, which inserts exclusively into the genome of podocytes. Panel B depicts a normal glomerulus. Like Suzuki's model just described, the podocytes are genetically labeled with the LAXE reporter gene. But in this case, the gene is constitutively activated by injection of doxycycline. Panels C and D up top show blue staining for beta-galactosidase is absent from segmental sclerotic lesions marked by the black asterisks, indicating that the podocyte population has been depleted in the sclerotic areas. They are preserved, however, in the unaffected portion of the same glomerulus. Panels E1 and E2 down below show co-localization of beta-galactosidase and podocyte marker synaptopodin within healthy podocytes, which validates the specificity of the LAC-Z reporter transgene for podocytes. Panels F1 and F2 show absence of beta-galactosidase and synaptopodin from sclerotic lesions, whereas both proteins are preserved within the unaffected portion of the same glomerulus. So Suzuki's results for collapsing glomerulopathy are recapitulated here. That is, podocytes are depleted from areas of segmental sclerosis. Smeets and colleagues repeat the experiment, this time using a reporter gene that inserts specifically into the genome of parietal epithelial cells rather than podocytes. The basic construct is shown in panel A. Panel B depicts a normal glomerulus where the pecs express beta-galactosidase and stain bright blue. Panels C through I show the progression from early FSGS to global glomerulosclerosis, beginning with bridging and migration of pecs into and around the tuft. Smeets also showed that activated CD44 positive parietal cells contribute to FSGS lesions in reporter mice induced by the 5-6 nephrectomy plus docosalt model. The panels to the left depict CD4 for positive PECs, in other words, activated PECs, as green. Looking at panel A, the arrow points to a tuft adhesion at 7 o'clock where green activated PECs are migrating across the bridge. The nearby arrowheads delineate CD44 positive PECs along Bowman's capsule adjacent to the adhesion. The lower panels show more advanced sclerotic lesions where CD44 is expressed by increasing numbers of PECs amassing around the areas of segmental sclerosis. Panels to the right show deposition of matrix material in red, which co-localizes with the CD44 positive or activated PECs. This material is referred to as BC matrix because the antibodies used to detect this structural protein target a proteoglycan that occurs in basement membranes surrounding Bowman's capsule but is not present in glomerular basement membranes. The BC matrix is normally secreted by PECs to maintain the basement membrane surrounding Bowman's capsule, but is being laid down here by activated PECs in areas of segmental glomerulosclerosis. Interestingly, the BC matrix is deposited along the outer surface of the glomerular basement membranes. To summarize, Smeets and colleagues show that podocyte injury and depletion results in focal activation of PECs, which form cellular adhesions between Bowman's capsule and the glomerular tuft. The adhesion then provides a bridge where activated PECs can migrate across and invade the tuft to stimulate sclerosis of the glomerulus. It should be emphasized that Smeets and company recapitulated these same findings in the spontaneous thigh 1.1 mouse model of FSGS and in the Munich-Wistar-Frumter rat model 
of FSGOs. In one final example, Eng and colleagues from the University of Washington employed an inducible and permanent genetic labeling approach to fate map PECs in a mouse model of FSGS initiated by cytotoxic sheep antipodocyte antibody. The cytotoxic antibody results in an abrupt podocyte depletion of about 50% over a two-week period and is accompanied by glomerulosclerosis and proteinuria. The interesting aspect of this model is that the podocytes regenerate swiftly so that the total depletion rate is about 20% at four weeks. Proteinuria partially remits as well. The figure shown here not only reproduces the results of Smeets and colleagues, but also extends their findings, as we'll see shortly. Panel D at the top left shows PECs tagged with the inducible LAC-Z reporter gene in decorated bright blue after deploying an enzyme histochemical procedure specific for beta-galactosidase. The PECs are in their normal position along Bowman's capsule prior to onset of FSGS. Panel K on the top right employs an alternative means of marking PECs by using anti-beta-galactosidase antibodies in an immunohistochemical approach. PECs stain red with this procedure and again are in their normal position along Bowman's capsule prior to onset of FSGS. The remaining panels show PECs present within the sclerose segments of the glomerular tuft, similar to Smeets et al. The next slide depicts a glomerulus from a baseline mouse prior to onset of FSGS. The panel to the left shows that podocytes express cell cycle inhibitor P57 in green. The panel on the right shows genetically labeled PECs expressing beta-galactosidase in red and are in their normal position along Bowman's capsule. Following the onset of FSGS, the panel to the left shows predictably that genetically labeled PECs in red migrate into the glomerulus following podocyte injury. The middle panel shows that podocyte marker P57 in green identifies what appears to be podocytes in the same tuft. After merging the images, however, we see in the panel to the far right that some cells stain yellow, the result of mixing red and green. These findings indicate that a subset of PECs within the tuft co-express podocyte marker P57. In other words, some PECs are differentiating towards podocytes within the milieu of glomerulosclerosis. The results are important because they fortify the concept that PECs serve as podocyte progenitors in disease. The reason why this has not been recognized in other experimental models of FSGS is likely due to the fact that the model employed by Eng and colleagues is characterized by a more abrupt loss of podocytes followed by a brisk replenishment of podocytes. The previous finding showing that CD44 expression in PECs is activated by the MAPK ERK pathway helped to further elucidate a possible mechanism of podocyte replenishment in FSGS. Eng et al. found that some PECs were CD44 positive and expressed phosphorylated ERK consistent with activation of the MAPK ERK pathway. These cells were compatible with activated PECs and considered the drivers of glomerulosclerosis. A second subset of PECs expressed podocyte markers but did not contain phosphorylated ERK, consistent with deactivation of the MAPK ERK pathway. These cells are likely programmed for regeneration. So, the expression of phosphorylated ERK helps to explain the fate of PECs in this model, though further studies are needed to confirm this biological response to podocyte injury and depletion. We return to our paradigm on the pathogenesis of FSGS to remind us of its complexity and to remind me of recent data suggesting that other cells can serve as podocyte progenitors. It appears that modified smooth muscle cells within the juxtaglomerular apparatus serve as stem cells with the capacity to migrate and transdifferentiate into multiple adult cell types in the kidney. These cells are referred to as cells of renal lineage or coral. C-O-R-L. Coral have been shown in some experimental models of FSGS to migrate out of the JGA and populate injured glomeruli. Here they adopt the phenotypic characteristics of both podocytes and parietal epithelial cells. I won't burden you with the details, but wanted to alert you to yet another potential reservoir for podocyte replenishment. We used to think of parietal epithelial cells as, as passive, and with nominal function. How naive we were. 
The figure displayed here from a review by Stuart Shanklin, University of Washington, illustrates how parietal epithelials have become a science unto themselves. This excellent review offers a comprehensive look at PECs and their complex role in health and disease and reaffirms much of what we discussed in today's podcast. It's an excellent reference for those who are interested in learning more about the function and dysfunction of parietal epithelial cells. So to summarize, we learned that collapsing glomerulopathy is a relatively new pattern of disease that was virtually non-existent prior to the early 1980s and whose incidence was tied initially to the AIDS epidemic. As the AIDS epidemic faded, however, recognition of collapsing glomerulopathy persisted and is currently associated with a number of conditions of which APOL1 risk alleles are perhaps the most important. We learned that parietal epithelial cells or PECs appear to play a key role in the pathogenesis of collapsing glomerulopathy and other variants of FSGS. We saw that PECs can serve as a reservoir for podocytes in health, that is during development and during routine maintenance of the glomerulus, at least through adolescence and possibly into adulthood. We learned too that the progenitorial capacity of PECs is finite and prone to dysregulation when stressed and saw examples of this by examining several experimental models of FSGS and collapsing glomerulopathy in the context of reporter mice. Though each model used a different stimulus to initiate podocyte injury, the response was stereotypical. That is the activation and migration of parietal epithelial cells onto or into the glomerular tuft was soon accompanied by sclerosis and or tuft collapse. Finally, we took stock in the fact that not all PECs are the same. Some are destined to be detrimental, whereas others are destined to be beneficial. Despite all that has been learned, there are still many questions left to answer. The biggest question of all, though, is can we cure this beast? For now, there is no optimized treatment for collapsing glomerulopathy unless it has a secondary etiology. If we can achieve a greater understanding of the pathogenesis of CG, then perhaps we can find a suitable target for precision medicinals to exploit. All we can do in the meantime is throw all manner of immunosuppression at the disease and hope that something sticks. That's it for today's podcast. On behalf of my colleagues at Arcana Labs, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention and hope that you learned something new and interesting. Please feel free to contact us with comments and questions through our Facebook and Twitter accounts. And have a wonderful day. 